This is week number two. Last week we talked about healing from the influence of evil and even from evil spirits in our lives, the different ways that they can sort of take over and uh, influence us. And we talked about letting God in so that he can influence us. Week two, we're talking about inner healing, interior healing. When God made us, he made us for his glory. And when he made us, if he made us for his glory, he made us to be whole. And it's a great little play on words in English that our word for wholeness sounds so much like holiness. Because that's really the truth of the matter. Being holy, what does that mean? It means being whole, being totally yourself, not being wounded, not being shattered, not being broken, to be whole. And that wholeness of the personality that's completely healthy is holiness. Is holiness, what is it? Basically, it's just being the best version of you, being the you that God made you to be. Not trying to imitate St. Francis or St. Dominic or the Blessed Mother, not trying to imitate people from the past, trying to be you and be the best version of you. They were the best versions of themselves in a very different world with very different personalities. You now, today, you're called to be holy. But a lot of times for us to be whole, we need to get through a lot of our junk. And God promised us that. Ezekiel chapter 36 this is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible, where God makes us this promise that he would restore us, bring us together, bring, bring, us, bring us back to wholeness. He's talking to a people in exile, a people that's been shattered by what they've gone through. And God talks about how his wrath and his fury have come upon them because of their infidelity to him. But then he says, I relented. And I will again show the holiness of my great name, desecrated among the nations, in whose midst you desecrated it. I will take you away from among the nations, gather you from all the lands and bring you back to your own soil. I will sprinkle clean water over you to make you clean from all your impurities and from all your idols I will cleanse you. It's a little of what we talked about last week. But then this, Ezekiel 36 verse 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. God promises us that. A restored heart, a new heart, a new spirit. A spirit that's no longer broken, a spirit that's healed. But we've got so many wounds. How many people have gone through some sort of trauma in their childhood? There's been abuse in your family, in yourselves. How many people have to say, my parents weren't there for me. I, I felt abandonment at an early age. How many can say that their father wasn't really around when they were growing up? That he was there, but he wasn't there. How many get their trauma later on in life through relationships that go sour, or relationships that become violent or difficult or broken, or addiction, many different ways that that takes over nowadays. Addiction to alcohol, to drugs, to pornography, even addiction to our phones, the way we are nowadays. All the ways in which we're enslaved. Those are wounds. And they control us, and they dominate us, and they keep us from moving forward. They keep the brakes on us. And here's a little what they lead to. What St. Paul talks about in Romans 7. One of the moments when we can really identify with what Paul is saying even more than other moments. He's talking about himself and he says, he's talking about doing good and doing the right thing in Romans chapter 7. But he says, what I do, I do not understand. For I do not do what I want, but I do what I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I concur that the law is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that good does not dwell in me, that is in my flesh. The willing is ready at hand, but doing the good is not. For I do not do the good I want, but I do the evil I do not want. When I want to do right, evil is at hand. It's this brokenness in us, this woundedness in us, leads us to really destructive behaviors and leads us to sin. 
Psychological help is what we usually seek when we're deeply wounded inside. And how expensive is that? And does it always work? I wish we could say it always worked. Many times what we're really needing is something deeper and something spiritual and not just psychological. We need to be, first of all, healed of our wounds. And then second of all, we need to be filled up by God. But it all begins with asking. Asking God for that. And it all begins with looking and doing it the right way. First, we have to acknowledge that we're wounded inside. It's what we do when we go to confession. But we have to recognize that we're in need of a deeper, sort of different type of healing. Confession will take away the guilt and the shame from sin. But the old image is that of a nail that's being driven into wood. Confession will take out the nail of sin in your life. But there's still that hole in the wood. You're not the same person you were before the sin. You're not the same person you were because of the damage that sin does to you. So, first of all, find the root of what it is that's unhealthy in us. Find the root of what that wound is. And sometimes that can take a long time to be perfectly deeply honest with ourselves or to realize that so many of the behaviors I'm engaging in now that are destructive are actually coming from a deep wound in my childhood or coming from a deep wound of something that happened to me. It sounds like a cliche because that's what the psychologists will always tell us. Psychiatrists will always tell us that it was something from our childhood, and yet so often it's true, and we see it day in, day out here at St. Peter's. So first it's finding the root of that difficulty. Often that will take help. It'll take dealing with it with someone else. It'll take going to a retreat and asking God to show you that, to show you what the root of that difficulty is. Sometimes even the people in this room that you're in right now watching this video, sometimes the people in your small group can help you discover that as you talk through things. Then we present it to Jesus, taking the root, whatever it is. Maybe it's even my own sinfulness and my own destructive behaviors when I was young. Taking that and presenting it to Jesus. Then most of the time, there's some sort of forgiveness that has to happen. There's someone I need to forgive. I was at a talk once where a psychologist told us, a whole audience of priests, that the secret of forgiveness is in the gospel. It's praying for your enemies, what Jesus asks us in Matthew chapter 5. Praying for our enemies, praying for the people who've hurt us, praying for the people we need to forgive, changes our hearts and softens our hearts so that little by little we can get closer to them and not just treat them as someone who's an enemy, someone who's at arm's length, but to realize that our only true enemies are evil spirits. They will never change. But everyone in this world is a potential friend and is meant to be brothers and sisters in heaven with God. There's no one who's truly your enemy, not on this earth. Our enemies are at a different, a different level, a different plane. Everyone here can be forgiven. Everyone here needs to be forgiven for you to be whole. Every single one of our wounds that's tied to unforgiveness and resentment is only going to fester and get worse until we get that moment of beginning that journey of forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't something you do in a single instant. It takes time. It's a process. But you have to begin that journey. You have to want to begin it. And then, as strange as this sounds, we need to get to the point of accepting God's love. Because very often, our woundedness draws us into ourselves and draws us into that hole in us and focuses us on it. And when God comes and offers us help, very often we, we manage to keep him at a distance. Sometimes we're more comfortable in our woundedness than we are with God reaching deep down into us. Sometimes God is offering us his love already and we're keeping him at a distance. So accepting God's love and letting God in and choosing God 100% and not choosing to anymore be attached to that sin, to saying, I'm totally yours, Lord. Now, how do we do that? With confession and communion is part of it, but also anything that's going to draw us to a deeper forgiveness, a deeper understanding of what our healing is, and then special moments and special events like a retreat. Special, there's Lent's coming up. There's going to be plenty of retreats offered all over, the, all over New York. 
Also, healing masses. If you speak Spanish and you're able to go this Friday, February the 13th, yes, it is a Friday the 13th, but anyway, if you're able to go this Friday and you're able to spend time there at Mass at 7 o'clock in the church with Father Elio, that could be a very powerful moment for you to get this inner healing. The type of healing that's most often felt at a healing Mass or at a healing service like that is inner healing, even more than physical healing. In fact, much more than physical healing. Because most of the time, it's what our deepest need is. Almost to conclude, Matthew chapter 5 is the same chapter that at the end, Jesus invites us to love our enemies and commands us to love our enemies. But it begins pretty differently. It begins with the Beatitudes, a very famous text. It says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Now listen to this from the perspective of someone who needs to be healed within. Because that's what Jesus is talking about. He's promising us that when we need to be healed within, He will do it. He's promising us that His divine mercy, like in the picture behind me, will overflow into us. Blessed are they who mourn, for they should be comforted, we just read. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be satisfied. Then he says this, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. In other words, blessed are you when you begin to let go, when you begin to forgive. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. And he says this, rejoice and be glad, for your, your reward will be great in heaven. Your reward will be great. But even now, that reward of God can be yours. It's for his glory that you be whole. It's for his glory that you be holy. It's for his glory that you be the person that he made you to be. So as you're seeking inner healing, and as you're going up to someone and asking them to pray for you, to pray over you, as you're going to a mass of healing, like this Friday, seeking inner healing, as you're going with your woundedness in all honesty and saying, Lord, fix heal me, you're doing the right thing because you're doing what God is inviting you to and has maybe been offering to you for a very long time, saying that you've been looking for healing in so many places. Now come seek it in me.